first time. Um, a special welcome to you. We are so glad uh, you've chose to uh, decided to worship with us this morning. It's truly a gift to do that. Uh, everything you need for the service will be uh, displayed on your screen. But if you'd like a soft copy of our Rhythms of Grace, a worship guide, you can download that from our website and track along the service as well. Um, now let's take a few minutes to pause and ready our hearts uh, for worship. And let's read through the reflections to help us with that. Let's take a few moments and then we'll get started. For those of you who have just joined in, uh, welcome to NCF. We're so glad uh, to be worshiping with you today. A brief thought before we begin. For, um, Shawshank Redemption is considered to be one of the greatest movies of all time. Uh, personally, that's uh, one of my favorite movies as well. And if you've ever seen that movie, uh, you would remember a character named Brooks, uh, Brooks Hatlin. Uh, he's a, uh, a, uh, an elderly inmate in the prison. Uh, he went to jail uh, for committing an act of violence uh, in his teenage years. And now in this um, a point in the uh, movie where he's 72 years old and he's serving as a prison librarian. Uh, it's hard not to like him. He's a great character. And uh, one day he gets a, a call from the prison warden and he hears the news that uh, his parole is granted. He's finally going to be released. After 50 years of life in prison, finally uh, a chance to taste freedom once again. But how does Brooks respond? Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the movie, uh, he, instead of being happy and celebrating, he panics and he's very scared and he's afraid uh, to consider the possibility of uh, living free in the world outside prison walls. And um, an inmate uh, named Red, uh, played by Morgan Freeman, uh, explains why Brooks acts the way he does. And this is what he says. He says, Brooks is just institutionalized. The man's been in here 50 years, 50 years. This is all he knows. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm telling you, these walls are funny. First, you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get to depend on them. That's being institutionalized. So uh, Brooks is finally released and the prison uh, ward uh, gets him an apartment, a small apartment and finds him a job at a grocery store. And uh, Brooks struggles to live uh, this life of freedom that he now has. And he writes letters to his prison inmates saying the world outside is so he's afraid and this newfound freedom uh, is so odd to him that he's unable to live free. And in a very powerful scene in the movie, um, we find Brooks, uh, he pulls a table in his apartment, climbs on the table, pulls out his pocket knife, 
and he carves on the ceiling. Brooks was here and finally hangs himself and commits suicide and dies because he, all because he does not know how to live a free life. And in, um, and in many ways, as I uh, was reflecting on today's focus, I find my own heart uh, like, like um, Brooks, and we all can identify with uh, Brooks here, that Christ has given us freedom, new life, and yet we do not know how to live uh, in freedom. We don't know we know what we are saved from, but we don't really know what we are saved for. And so this morning, uh, our time, we are going to see how God not only rescues us from slavery to sin and from the prison of our own making, our own selfish desires that imprison us, but also what we are freed for, the life that we were designed to live. We were made to live in freedom, uh, to flourish and thrive under God's um, just laws that that help us live free lives and so that's the, going to be our focus the god who delights to save people and helps them experience the freedom that comes uh, living under his rule and reign with that in mind let me invite you to a call to worship from psalm 27 please join me the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the stronghold of my life of whom shall I be afraid? One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Friends, come, let us worship the Lord together. Savior, 
risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. seated on the throne and nothing in all creation can compare to you we look at everything around us god the moon and the stars and everything that you have created um, and we're just in awe that you are mindful of us and that you care for us um, even though you are seated on the throne god that you lowered yourself um, to be one of us god we praise you for that through your son that you have crowned us with glory and honor and you have made us yours you are our light and our salvation. You are the stronghold of our lives, and we have nothing to be afraid of. God, we praise you for this steadfast and everlasting love that you have given us, a love that nothing can separate us from, a love that is vast, unmeasured, boundless, and free, a love that never changes, a love that caused you to make the biggest sacrifice for us. God, we praise you for Jesus Christ who died, and more than that, was raised to life and is now interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. deep, deep love of Jesus, vast and measured, boundless free, rolling 
love of Jesus spread his praise from shore to shore how he Now we uh, come to a time of confession. And here we uh, acknowledge and admit that just like Brooks, having been uh, set free from uh, prison, he uh, so desired to go back into the walls and to the safety of the prison walls, because that's the only life he knew as a prisoner. Um, and so we too, as God's people, having been rescued and redeemed from sin and slavery, uh, that where we've been imprisoned in, we uh, desire to uh, go back to the things that once enslaved us. And so let's take this time to uh, uh, admit and confess uh, our longing to live in sin and in slavery to sin. Uh, and knowing that God, uh, as we just sang, the current of his love is so uh, powerful to hold us and to keep us, to forgive us, and to embrace us. So with that in mind, join me and let's use this prayer of confession to turn to our Savior. God, our Redeemer, you have saved your people through Jesus Christ, your Son. You have delivered your people out of slavery to sin and have freed us into new life. Yet, we still wander through the wilderness of our sins. How quickly we forget who you are how quickly we forget all our blessings, how quickly we forget all your good commandments that guide our new lives in Jesus Christ. Forgive us our sins, renew our hearts and minds that we may understand the gospel. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see the sweet hope of faith in Christ. Return us to the covenant that you sowed to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Continue to establish us as your people. Free us from the idols that ensnare us and bind us to your grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's use the next uh, few moments to confess our personal and private sin and shame to God, knowing that there's never a time in our lives when our confession of sin is not met with God's grace and forgiveness. With that confidence, let us I'll take the next few moments to bring our specific and personal sense to God.
to all those who have placed your faith and confidence in Jesus, hear now the assurance of pardon from Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Rejoice in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And God's people respond, thanks be to God, amen. Having uh, been assured of God's um, forgiveness, now we move into a time of offering. And here we offer up our whole lives and our whole hearts and our financial gifts uh, and treasures to God. So let's take this time to um, bring our tithes and offerings to him. We do this in two ways. You can continue giving online or you can set aside this week's uh, tithes and offerings and bring it when we meet together in person. The bank details are posted here uh, in the chat box. It's available on our website and our WhatsApp as well. But let's come to him and give cheerfully. I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew I hear my cry for mercy were you to count my sinful ways how could I for your throne yet full forgiveness meets my gaze I stand redeemed by grace alone I will wait for you I will wait for you on your word I will rely I will wait for you Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in his part to save completely. Christ emerging from the grave. Now he has come to make a way. And God himself has paid the price. That all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Shall we wait for you till my soul is satisfied? I will wait for you. I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. Good morning, church. Um, we're so glad you're here this morning joining us for the Lord's Day service. We're happy to have you here with us. And 
um, especially if you're here for the very first time or are visiting, we extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Um, if you would like to get it, uh, if you'd like us to get in touch with you uh, and um, and have have a word with you, uh, if you'd like to make yourselves known to us, uh, please do fill out the welcome form that will be posted in uh, the chat pod uh, right now. Uh, do fill it out so that we can uh, yeah get in touch with you. Um, the city kids can now leave uh, for their own. Uh, Zoom call. Uh, this morning, our leaders are Christina and Pui. Uh, thank you, ladies, for serving our kids and uh, NCF this way. Um, yeah. Um, this week, we start our new uh, sermon series. Uh, we're looking at the Ten Commandments, and the, the sermon series is uh, is called uh, "The Law of Love." And let us um, hear from the Word. Uh, how God reveals his character, how God reveals uh, his heart for his people through um, the commandments that he gave uh, his people in the desert. Um, uh, I, we really hope that you will be able to plug in and uh, listen week on week to, on, to the sermon series and uh, learn from the word. Uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago when we had a congregational meeting, we talked about the congregational vote. Now NCF is moving, is, is considering moving to a new denomination. Uh, it's called the Presbyter Presbyterian Church of India Reformed. We're considering moving there, uh, moving to that presbytery, to that, sorry, to that denomination. And we're, um, we're seeking a congregational vote on this. Now we were supposed to have that vote next week. Um, and we had uh, announced this two weeks ago uh, so that people can ask questions, people can clarify any, uh, any thoughts that they have with uh, the elders or with uh, Pastor Rakshit. And um, so we, we have decided, uh, the session has decided that we will extend this by another week. Uh, we've had some good questions. We've had some good conversations. So just in case you have some uh, thoughts around this or you want to clarify something, please feel free to reach out to, to Rakshit uh, or to the elders. So uh, having postponed it, we will now have this congregational vote on the 25th. Uh, so on the 25th, after our church service, we will have the congregational vote on, um, on moving to uh, the new denomination. Uh, this is an important um, um, decision and uh, we'd like all voting members and associate members to make an informed choice and therefore this additional time to, uh, to clarify and to ask questions. Um, also, uh, as you can see, there's a, uh, if you attended our in-person services or you're seeing everything that's happening on the Zoom call right now, a lot of work goes into um, set up into production, into teardown. There's so much that happens behind the scenes. And so this is my repeated, our repeated uh, appeal for help for volunteers to rise to the occasion and volunteer their time and their talents. Um, we have a few people who are helping us week in and week out, but um, it helps to have more volunteers and to have more uh, people learning um, uh, all the all the tools that go into uh, a Sunday morning service. Um, I personally feel um, this is uh, this gives us a great amount of life experience, having done set up uh, in, at NCF and before. Um, it gives a, it, it helps with learning a lot of tech stuff, um, uh, and 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 just volunteering uh, is a wonderful opportunity to also get to know NCF really well and the people um, involved. So, so please consider signing up. Um, the Rhythms of Grace, our worship guide has a link for that. Uh, please um, go to that, fill out a form and someone will get in touch with you on opportunities to volunteer. Um, yeah, that's, that's about all the announcements that I had. Um, would you join me in uh, praying Loving Father, we come into your holy, welcoming, and comforting presence. 
knowing that you are creator, master, redeemer, father, and keeper, and lover of our souls. You have borne our sins through sacrifice. You have conquered the sting of death itself. Your son became our Christ to, became, to become cursed and crushed to death. But all of this to regenerate us to everlasting life. Thank you, Father. And we come into your presence this morning with some, uh, with some trembling, with some anxiety, with some uh, joy. Uh, there's so much that is going on in the lives of your people this morning. Father, as the crisis that we had imagined was on the decline and in a state of defeat, as this crisis rears its um, devastating head again, um, we confess that we're in some, uh, we're, our hearts are anxious. We're so intensely grateful for your people, for the healing that you have afforded your people, for, um, for wonderful results for Nikhil and Sarah and Joshua and his family, but we're, uh, we're sad and we're anxious this morning to hear of more of our congregation members uh, unwell. Father, we pray uh, for Ben, for Sonia, for baby Haley, um, for Philip and Salome. Uh, Father, would you please protect these families? We pray for Elijah to, to be protected at this point in time from, um, from getting this, this infection. Father, would you um, bring these families, bring these brothers and sisters um, into your presence and, and, and take away the evil effects of this disease, um, grant them full healing, grant them full restoration of their bodies. Father, we uphold all the congregation, the, the entire uh, your entire body of NCF. Father, we pray, especially for our older risk-prone ones who are at the greatest risk. Father, protect them while they wait for their vaccinations. Would you help us to bring to memory and impose on our hearts the truth that you are sovereign and that, you, that our living hope is in you, even while we wait uh, with anxious hearts for this cloud, for this, for this season of, um, this virus to pass. Father, at, this, at the same time, would you help uh, your church respond to the needs of those unwell, those needing assistance in praying and in providing, in caring for the people of NCF and for the people of Bangalore. Father, we pray, especially as the virus spreads quickly, we pray for those um, in enforcement and those in the medical profession as they come into the front line in a whole new way. Uh, Father, protect us. Father, we remember the specific needs of the congregation this morning. In this season of change, we pray for the families that are looking at life-changing and life-altering situations and decisions. Father, we are thankful for time that, that we have had with them and as they as, as, and, and we pray that you will prepare the hearts of your people to completely and totally depend on you in this season of change. And Father, as people move, we pray for gospel-centered and gospel-seeking community for you to plant them in. In a season of so much ambiguity, uh, we pray for uh, students and young graduates looking for jobs. Father, you have given us a body of a lot of young people um, as they navigate the new normal. Father, would you give our young people opportunities to shine despite all the challenges facing them? Father, where needed, help our young ones reskill and re-equip to adapt to these changing times. And we pray for our students to continue to study well in this age of distraction and lack of classroom settings. Father, we pray for fewer interruptions to their academic schedules. Father, as lockdowns begin to appear again, would you give families opportunities to enjoy time together, bringing them closer to each other, bringing them closer to you. Father, we pray for protection over families as means of earnings and livelihoods are threatened and placed in jeopardy. We pray for businesses that are struggling again as a result of lockdowns. Father, help, uh, 
help these families, help these businesses recover. Um, Father, when movement and services are limited during these lockdowns, we pray for the sick and the old, the disabled, um, and those who are severely dependent on others to care for them. Would you open the eyes of your people that we might serve them, that we may respond, and that the government will respond to facilitate care. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with mental illness and need to cope with all the changes and the periods of isolation that we have to go through at this point in time. Father, as we um, consider and ponder over and meditate on the Ten Commandments in this season, would you give us a glimpse into your very heart and open our hearts to soak up the beauty of your character and thoughts towards us? Would you prepare the hearts of your servants who will speak your words to us? As we learn you, Father, help us to truly believe in the fulfillment of the law that was achieved through your son. Help us to understand that it, what it means um, to have godly sorrow over our sin and to lean into Christ and the gospel to fight sin in that power. Teach us to soak up your, your love and be gospel infused each day of our lives. Help our hearts to be captivated by your deep, deep love for us. Father, we often do not enjoy the instruments of your grace towards us. Would you teach us to treasure, enjoy, and um, love, this, love times of prayer and bringing our adoration, confession, our thanksgiving, and our supplication to you? This prayer, Father, we bring as a congregation to you in the name of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May I ask the scripture reader to read our scripture, scripture portion for this morning, please? Good morning, sir. Uh, today's scripture uh, portion is taken from Exodus chapter 1 and 2. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Zachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh, store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work on, in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves, then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? and let the male children live. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. 
but you shall let every daughter live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while a young, while a young, uh, while a young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women and she took it. She opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of Hebrew's children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you, call you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to, said to her, go. So the, so the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he stuck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, you strike your companion. He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the traps to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father's jewel, he asked, he, he said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered, delivered us out of, the, out, of the land of, out of the hand of shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son and he called his name Geshem. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. The cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. This is God's word. Thank you, Ashish, for reading God's word for us. Um, Today we start a new sermon series um, on the Ten Commandments, but today specifically we'll look at um, the book as a whole because we will look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 starting next week onwards. But um, in order to rightly understand those Ten Commandments, I think we need to place them well in our own minds where those Ten Commandments fall in the big storyline in the in the big picture uh, Genesis is a story of the creation of the world which then focuses on the creation of God's people through an Iraqi a pagan idolater an idol worshiper an idol maker named Abraham and God looks and from creation and after the fall of our first parents uh, it somewhat very swiftly, it moves into Abraham. And so God makes a covenant with Abraham, which is passed on 
um, as a hand-me-down. The covenant is passed down to Isaac and Jacob. And uh, at the end of Genesis, if, you've, uh, if you remember, it ends with this story of uh, Joseph. Joseph uh, was, is, is one of the sons of... Um, Mike is not loud enough. Okay, let's try that again. Um, let me know if I need to increase my volume or something. Um, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so if you remember back in uh, just, a, 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 just the page before where Exodus starts, um, you have uh, you know, Joseph. He is one of the sons of Jacob, but his brothers out of jealousy have uh, sold him into slavery and they uh, uh, dupe their father Jacob into thinking that Joseph's dead um, only when a famine struck where Jacob's family was he sends his son to the neighboring kingdom of Egypt to find out if there's any provision and Joseph by this time from being a slave in a prison has become the prime minister of the kingdom for his wisdom and he finds favor in the eyes of Pharaoh king of Egypt the Pharaoh at that time and so the, the entire family ends up moving into Egypt um, and Joseph dies. And the very first word, which I think most English translations leave out, um, is, is were, the Hebrew word were uh, in, in, uh, for the book of Exodus, which means and. So clearly uh, the author of Exodus wants us to read Genesis and Exodus together. He wants us to read as a, as a continued storyline. But there's a huge 400-year time lapse, a huge 400-year time lapse uh, between uh, the end of chapter 50 of Genesis to, the cha to chapter 1 of Exodus. During this time, yeah, the, the people have grown from being a small nomadic family um, set, who, are, who have now settled down in Egypt, who are under the favor of Pharaoh uh, of Egypt himself, to have now grown from a moderate-sized family to a nation-sized group of people. And they are formally given the name Israel, an, an ethnic group, a people group called Israel. They're now working as slaves because... Pharaoh is jealous of them. Pharaoh is scared of them. Egyptians are scared of them. And that's true in, in any country, right? When there's a surging minority of uh, people, uh, the majority population tends to get scared of the surging minority. And that's something what we see in the book of Exodus too. The Egyptians are scared. And then Pharaoh decides to subjugate them. They, he puts them into slavery. And as we have seen... Um, uh, or as we've heard it read and read it for ourselves, uh, Pharaoh is now threatening to destroy the entire people group. So what we see in Genesis is a creation of God's people. What we see in Exodus is redemption of God's people. And the, in, the story continues through the book of Exodus. And today's sermon points, I have three sermon points, which sort of tries to cover the big themes of the of the three big sections of the entire book. Firstly, deliverance from slavery. Secondly, deliverance by a redeemer. Thirdly and finally, deliverance into a promised land. Firstly then, deliverance from slavery. We see this in uh, chapters one through 18. Um, just, the, just chapters three to 40 itself this huge section of Exodus covers one year, uh, just one year. And that's how significant those chapters are. So in chapters 1 through 18, God is now raising up Moses. And it's, it's an interesting name because in Hebrew, as we've read, it means draw out, draw out of. Um, but in Egyptian language, it means son of, dot, dot, dot. Um, because usually 
uh, Egyptian sons would be named, for example, Atmosis, son of At, or Ketimosis, son of Keti. Um, but with Moses, you just have son of. It's almost a play of words when, um, when uh, the, the, the princess receives the ch child in, from the river, she's calling him Moses, son of, dot, dot, dot. She's trying to figure out who this is as a way to sort of point at whose son is this? What is he going to do? Uh, it's sort of evoking imagination in us and try, sort of giving us a cliffhanger, wait for it, details to follow kind of thing. But then he was drawn out of water from the Hebrew language. It's a play on words. And by the way, there is the entire scripture Jesus says is pointing to him. Imagine all the sing single threads of scripture, right? Um, each figure, each major character, or each major incident, let's say Moses, since we are in Exodus, a major character, and a major incident, let's say the plagues, or even the crossing of the Red Sea. Imagine t tying a string, a thread, to all of those things. And then pulling it all together at the end, you have one thick rope, right? And that rope is held onto by Jesus Christ. He is tugging the entire Old Testament to himself and to a great finish, a great end of story. So one good principle of interpreting scripture when you read Exodus um, in your own time or as you're listening to these sermons is to know that every portion of scripture, Exodus included, um, each major, when, whenever he's, he or she is successful, is pointing to the, to the even more successful deliverer named Jesus Christ. Um, when there's a huge significant event, it's somehow pointing to the, to the redemption, the ultimate redemption of God's people. So we have in Moses, God um, drawing out as though, it, it, you know, when you read the description of, of um, the, the little basket that Moses, baby Moses was put in, it's kind of some of the same stuff that Noah's Ark was made of. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is telling the readers as they're reading it to make these little connections that he's pointing to. Remember Noah's Ark, the huge boat through which uh, the world was saved and God's people were saved? Well, there's another incident like that happening where Moses, the first of the Israelites, is put in a basket and ultimately he will be the deliverer of God's people. So uh, at retirement age in chapters three and four, we just read till the end of chapter two. In chapters three and four, you know, Moses flees Egypt. He, he you know, sets aside and throws away or uh, he is kicked out of the palace uh, for whatever reason. And well, we know the reason. But the, the, what kicks him out of, the, out of Egypt is really the fact that there is a burning desire in him. The situation was that he killed an Egyptian. Um, and so he flees to Midian and he ends up rescuing, um, you know, these girls and the girls introduce them, uh, introduce Moses to their father named Jethro. So Moses is 80 years old now. He is thinking he's going to retire in Midian. He's, he's married and he's going to have children. And no, God actually calls him to be the deliverer of his people. Just when he thought he would settle down and he's about to die, God calls him at a burning bush, a bush that was not being consumed by the fire that was in it. And he threw it, God speaks to him and says, I want you to be my deliverer. I want you to be the one through whom I will rescue my people. So in chapters seven through 12, after much, much uh, hesitancy, Moses ends up going to Pharaoh. So you can imagine this, this old octogenarian coming back into the palace with, um, with the guys that he grew up with um, being courtiers and, um, and now the new Pharaoh and he confronts him and he says, God says, let my people go. Yahweh says, let my people go. Pharaoh ends up mocking this Yahweh. Pharaoh ends up mocking God. And so God, in judgment, sends plagues after plagues. Interestingly, 
each of those plagues, you know, let's say the frogs, the locusts, uh, the sun being hidden, or the Nile uh, running with blood, all of those things were actually God's, God exercising his, showing his superiority over those gods. The Egyptian god, the Egyptians worshipped Nile because at times um, they were, you know, when, when the Nile was supposed to be giving great vegetation, uh, they would actually worship an idol that had the head of a, of a man with a huge beard, with muscles, and a huge pregnant belly. Uh, I know it looks, this sounds disgusting, um, but it's to go to show that the Nile was worshipped as a symbol that sustains the Egyptian people. That the Nile is the one that preserves the Egyptian people. So they worshipped all these gods, and when, when Yahweh um, bloodies the Nile River, he's saying, Nile is not God, I am God. So he's repeatedly giving us signs. He tells people, he, he's telling the Egyptian people, I am the true God. But, but he's also affirming the Israelites, you know, all these 400 years you were subjugated, you were enslaved, you were made to worship these other gods and you were forced to do it. Um, but now know that I am the true God. Yahweh, I am that I am is now here and I will come. For your rescue and Moses comes and delivers this message over and over again to Pharaoh but each time he only hardens his heart ultimately Pharaoh the last plague was that the firstborn of the Egyptians uh, sons would die all the male children will die the thing that we just read Pharaoh wanted to do to the Egypt uh, to the Hebrew population to the Israelites the killing of their firstborn male children, so, just, so that all their, you know, they will be done away with as a population, God sends as a plague upon the Egyptians. Again, telling the Egyptians that Yahweh is the true and living God. It's, a, it's dramatic. Exodus, when truly and rightly understood, when, made all the, when you make all these different connections, it, it makes for a great movie. Well, there have been a couple of movies now. Um, and you see why. It's such a big adventure story. But something significant is happening. God is delivering his people from slavery. He's calling them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, the place where they were made to work and work and work, where pregnant women were not given any leniency. They were made to work. And old people were not given any leniency. They were made to work. Children were not given any leniency. They were made to work and constantly. And with each rising, with each subsequent plague, the, the amount of labor they had to do at the hand of their slave masters only increased, kept on increasing. And as, as, they were, as, um, as their labor was increasing, God shows even more uh, dramatically who the true and living God of all the earth is. It is not Nile, it is not the frogs, it is not the locusts, but it is I am that I am. The one who never changes. And so Yahweh sends Moses to sovereignly save his people. And that's one of the themes throughout, um, throughout the book of Exodus. That while he's while Moses is the human agent through whom deliverance comes to the Israelites, it is God who is the one who saves, who initiated deliverance from slavery. It is God. It is God who went after Moses. It is God who rescued Moses. It is God who took Moses out of the land of Egypt into Midian, into the wilderness. And it is God who in the wilderness spoke to spoke to Moses and sent him back into Egypt uh, to rescue his people out of this land of slavery into the promised land. It is God who initiates the whole thing. It is also God who hardens people's hearts. And that is something that we will repeatedly see throughout, uh, throughout this book. While Pharaoh is told that, uh, we are told that Pharaoh hardens his heart with each subsequent plague. We are also told that God hardens 
Pharaoh's heart. I don't know the full mechanics of how it all works. But we must say this, that each of us have a will to choose. And we are capable of hardening our own hearts. But because God is sovereign and nothing escapes his sovereignty, because any king, he is only a, he can be called the best of kings are the ones who have absolute sovereign control over their kingdoms. And God being the king of all kings has absolute sovereign control over everything in his dominion. And by the way, everything is, is in his dominion. And so each one of our hearts are at, a, at this king's disposal. He hardens Pharaoh's heart while Pharaoh hardens his own heart. That precise language is used over and over and over again to point out the fact that God is sovereign. The same God who hardened Pharaoh's heart is the same God who draws people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. God is sovereign over his people and over all the earth. Coming back to the main point, God's deliverance, you see, comes from the hand of Moses, who did not have wealth or military might. He didn't even have strength in his body to keep his hands up for too long a time. But he was the chosen instrument of God to deliver his people from the hands of Pharaoh, who possessed so much wealth, one of the wealthiest kingdoms of that time. And he possessed great military might. You see, the riches of this world, what seems like strength in this world, is not what works in the economy of God's kingdom. God uses the weakest of the weak to display his power and his glory. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, Paul says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The dominion of darkness is slavery to our own sinful desires. Have you been frustrated with your sin at times? You wish the same stuff that you're struggling with would not come and nag you, frustrate you? Well, that frustration comes from the fact that we struggle still with the power of sin. Sin still holds sway over us. And without, without Jesus Christ and his work of redemption, we will be absolutely under the sway of sin and Satan. But you see, something better than Moses has come. Someone better than Moses has come. The true and better Moses, Jesus Christ, he came down into this world. He was driven out into the wilderness. And he was sent to rescue his people out of slavery, the dominion of darkness, and lead them through the waters of judgment into the promised land, the new creation. Jesus Christ is the true and better Moses. And by the way, yes, we can say that all of God's people are the new Israel now, including the Jews who believe in Jesus Christ. But Matthew takes Israel, the, the whole story of what is going on in Exodus, and applies it to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Israel who was ransomed from Egypt. Jesus is a true and better Moses, and he's the true and better Israel. Because the prototypical Israelite, Jesus Christ, not Moses, has come into the domain of darkness and he has conquered death and rose victorious over darkness and death itself. Any who trusts in him, he will lead through the waters of judgment, the Red Sea, into the promised new creation. Moses is a type of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing we see, deliverance from slavery. Secondly, and quickly, deliverance by a redeemer. If, if in the first portion of, of, in chapters 1 through 18, God is providing a, de a deliverer to the people of Israel in Moses, in chapters 19 through 24, God is giving 
a new law by which his people are to be governed through the hands of Moses. So Moses acts as the deliverer in the first section. Now he acts as the lawgiver in Moses. God speaks through Moses and gives the Ten Commandments. And so Exodus 20 falls right in the middle of it, where God gives his people, or rather reminds them of his character, his original character, because they are now being need, needing to be retrained and reoriented in their thinking. For 400 years, their fathers and forefathers have been subjugated and enslaved. What happens when a majority culture so heavily oppresses a minority culture? Inevitably, the minority culture ends up imbibing some of the stuff from majority culture, most of which may not all be all that good. So God's people are in need of reminding. And so he, he lays out, God gives the Ten Commandments through the hands of Moses. And Moses acts as that law giver to God's people. Now at the hand of Jesus Christ, we have the one who has kept the law perfectly because Moses couldn't. We have the true and better lawgiver in Jesus Christ. It is as though the, the Ten Commandments, if we were to take it on its own accord, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, I have worshipped God's other gods every day of my life, and I still struggle with it. I am guilty of breaking all of the Ten Commandments. And even if I picked any one of them, and if I've broken one of them in the slightest manner, God's word says we have broken all ten. I am guilty. So it is as though God gives this law to Moses. And seeing that God's people are now guilty, they know what they are guilty of in their sin. Because we don't know what's wrong until we are told what's wrong, right? They are being told what's wrong and they end up doing the same stuff. You remember how just as Moses goes up to the mountain to speak to God and acts as the spokesperson and intercessor for God's people. And he comes down with, with the tablets. He sees Aaron, the priest, making a golden calf and calling that Yahweh. It is Aaron's sacred cow. He led God's people into false worship. They were guilty. And, as, uh, and subsequently, we are too, because we have the same nature as they. All of us have broken God's law. So the law that was given to Moses, God takes it from his hand and gives it to Jesus Christ. Because where Moses failed, Jesus succeeds. He keeps the law of God completely and perfectly without fail. He keeps the Ten Commandments perfectly, to the T. Gold quality obedience from Jesus Christ. He never failed. And this Jesus Christ has not only become the law giver, has become, this Jesus Christ has become the law keeper. And because of his keeping the law perfectly, any who trusts in him, the Father is willing to look at us through this perfect law keeper, Jesus Christ. Jesus is a true and better Moses, not just for being a deliverer, but also for being a good and perfect lawgiver and law keeper. Deliverance by a redeemer. In Romans 6, we, Paul says that having been set free from sin, God's people are now slaves of righteousness. We were once slaves of unrighteousness. We, have, we were once slaves of sin. We were under the dominion, in the dominion of darkness, under the tyranny of sin. But now, having been redeemed by Jesus Christ, the great deliverer and the great lawkeeper and lawgiver, the true and better Moses, we now have become slaves of righteousness. Further, Paul says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Deliverance from slavery. Deliverance by a redeemer. Thirdly and finally, deliverance into a promised land. In chapters 25 to 40, 
um, God gives instructions to Moses to build a tabernacle, a visible symbol of his presence manifest among his people. It is a symbol which says God dwells among his people. And the Shekinah glory descends at the very end of the book. God descends to dwell among his people. And that, you see, is the real promised land. New creation, the, heaven, the new heavens and the new earth, is not, is not the new heavens and the new earth because it's, it's a place free of sin, free of sickness, free of sorrow, free of death, free of agony, free of conflict, um, perfect peace, perfect harmony. All of that is true. But they are all byproducts of the fact that God has come to dwell among his people. God's, God's presence is tabernacled. God tabernacles among his people. But now we have the perfect tabernacle. Remember John 1. John is using Exodus, the, uh, the story of Exodus and saying, This Jesus Christ came down, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. But still we are waiting, right? Jesus has come once and has risen again. And he has ascended to the Father. But he has promised. Remember what the angel said. This same Jesus whom you have seen ascend will come back again. He will bring the new creation. He will bring that eternal life that he has promised to us with, in full vision. We will see it one day. And it's coming soon. Jesus will deliver on his promises. The same God who promised to Abraham that he will rescue. The same God who promised to Moses that he will rescue his people and lead them into the promised land. Has by the mouth of Jesus said, he will come for us and he will deliver us and take us into the promised land. In the final section in, in chapters 25 to 40, um, Moses acts like the great worship leader he leads God's people into God's presence and leads them into worshiping Yahweh at the tabernacle so he's acted as the deliverer the lawgiver and now as the worship leader but in Jesus Christ we have the true and better Moses he is the great pastor remember the author of Hebrews he says in Hebrews 4 we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens the son of God Again, in chapter 8, he says, We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Not Moses, but Jesus. And in Hebrews 10, it says that we have a high priest over God's house, over the church of God, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is a true worship leader. He is the great high priest. He is the true pastor. He shepherds his people into the promised land. He is even now interceding for God's people before the Father. Not upon a mountain like Moses spoke to Yahweh. But up in the heavens itself, Moses could not dare enter the very presence of God. Jesus Christ has entered that place. And he is the prototypical Christian, you see. All those who believe in Jesus Christ, do you know what you're going to get? It's everything that Jesus got. That e everything that Jesus is right now enjoying, we will enjoy in that great promised land of new creation. Where we will dwell in the Father's presence. We will physically and tangibly fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. He will indeed fully tabernacle among us. Right now, he does dwell in us by his Holy Spirit in us. But then, himself, physically. My dear friends, Exodus is not just a story, uh, a story that happened in the past. It is, not, it is definitely not mythology. Just stories to point to abstract truths. It's real history. It, this, is, this entire book is to act like a mini story of what is to happen in Jesus Christ. 
So as you read and as you listen to the sermons that follow, remember that the entire book is all about Jesus. And that is the final aim of this book. This book is not about you and me. It is not about um, is the Israelites. Ultimately, this is not even about our salvation. The Bible is not about us. It is about Jesus Christ and His glory. It is the glory of God that is written in Exodus, that floods Exodus, that points us always as we read the pages of Exodus. It is to point to the fact that God, for His own glory, has led a throng of people out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, out of the land of slavery into the land of slaves of God, out of the land of unrighteousness to a land of perfect righteousness, out of Egypt into new creation. This whole thread of Exodus is one that says God's people were once groaning, but they are now being led into a land all glorious. From groan to glory is the theme of Exodus. And that is the theme of each one of us, isn't it? For those of you who are listening and who do not have a, a speakable relationship with Jesus Christ, who have never really trusted in Him, remember that you will always be stuck in groaning, never to attain glory. It will only remain as a desire at best. But there will come a time when you will be cast away from God's presence because it is only through faith in Jesus Christ you will be brought into the land of Christ's glory. The groaning that you now experience only pales in comparison to the glory that you will experience forever if you don't repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ today. But for those of us who have trusted in Christ, from groan to glory, that is our theme. That is our song. The glory we get to experience in part now. And we can even grow in experiencing that glory more and more each day now. But that glory will be full, final, complete and perfect when the King of glory comes and establishes his reign among his people and he himself dwells with us forever in the new creation. The story of Exodus is our story too. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the book of Exodus. We pray, O oh God, that you will, you will give us this, you will lay the truths of this book in our hearts. And as we start the new sermon series on the Ten Commandments, that you will lay upon our hearts what you've called us to. Pray, O oh Father, that you'll bring many to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as a result of, these, of this sermon series. We praise you, O oh God, for your kindness and your mercy, in not just giving Moses, someone who will lead us from one kingdom to another kingdom, but you have led us through Jesus Christ into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, how we long to be with him. We pray, O oh God, that you will send your son yet again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. When I fear my faith will fail 
Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail. He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, he will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. But by him at such a cost. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raise with him to endless life he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold Amen. Friends, receive now the Lord's benediction. Um, remember that our congregational vote is coming up in a couple of weeks. It's on the 25th. Um, and also that um, uh, it'll, the polling will be online. If we happen to meet uh, online that Sunday as well, it'll happen. Uh, that is for our services. Uh, we will, the polling will happen on Zoom right after the benediction. Uh, but if we are able to meet in person, we'll figure out an alternate way to get the polling done, and we'll keep you guys posted on it. But as David said, feel free to reach out to me during the week if you have any questions uh, about our joining this new denomination. This is God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and God's people respond. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace and have a great week.